As we come to the Parsha where Abraham moved away from Ur of the Chaldees towards a promised land, we see that he takes Lot, his nephew, with him. Lot's father has died, and it is appropriate for him now to be under his uncle Abraham's covering. However, their respective shepherds keep having run-ins with each other, and the time comes for them to separate. Actually, it should be a good thing. We are meant to grow and divide in the body, just like living cells. We can occupy more territory and spread the good news of Jehovah, Almighty God, who is the Lord of heaven and earth, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love, and also the news of Yeshua, our Messiah, who makes the way for reconciliation with the Father. Abraham gives Lot his choice of territory, and Lot, after the flesh, chooses what looks good in order to prosper his herds. It is specifically written that he chose the land before God destroyed the two cities, and that it was already known that the people that lived there were wicked. It is good to remember that Jehovah can change things on a dime, as spoken of in Esther. For his part, Abraham takes the land that remains, knowing that Jehovah has promised him the land and will prosper him no matter where he goes. We can say that Abraham lives by the Spirit. We should always walk by faith and not by sight, as written in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Sometime after this split, the people of the area are involved in a regional war. Apparently, the local king of Sodom and perhaps the other cities of the plain had been vassal states to Elam under Kedilaomer for 12 years. In the 13th year, they quit paying taxes, and in the 14th year, a confederation of Kedilaomer with three other kings attacked Bera, the king of Sodom, along with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinav, king of Adma, Shemever, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar, all cities of the dead plain. The purpose of Kedilaomer's campaigns was to show his might to all territories under Elamite authority. His armies and allies plundered the tribes and cities who were en route to the rebellious cities on the Jordan Plain. They took provisions for the army for their continuing campaign. Genesis 14, 8-10 says, On his way to the plain he plundered these places, the Rephaim in Ashtarot Karnaim, the Zuzim in Cham, the Emim in Shaveh Kiryataim, the Horites in Mount Sa'ir as far as El Paran near the wilderness, the Amalekites in Kadesh at En Mishpat, the Amorites at Hazazon Tamar. We recognize that at least the Rephaim, the Zuzim, and the Emim were all of the giant clans. Kedela Omer's armies must have been fierce. In the end, it was a rousing defeat for the cities of the plain, and Kedela Omer took all the spoil, the goods, and the persons, including Lot. When Abraham heard of this, he organized 318 of his fighting men, in what must have been a raiding party. They probably surprised the army of Kedalo Omer by attacking at night and retrieved all the goods and people belonging to the king of Sodom. What do you think? Were those people relieved? What was Lot thinking about his future? Now here comes the king of Sodom requesting from Abraham the return of the people. He doesn't care about the plunder, he just wants the people. I imagine he was very grateful to Abraham, and I believe at this point, Lot could have chosen to stay with his uncle or to move to a different area. The king of Sodom would have let him go. It is written in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And God delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot had clearly experienced firsthand the evils of the city, and so perhaps he might have changed his mind about living there. So often Yehovah sends an enemy to reprove his people. Perhaps all that transpired in the war should have been a warning to Lot to come out of Sodom. But he did not. He chose to stay, and in the end he suffered the consequences. King Hezekiah also got a second chance. From Second Kings 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said unto him, Thus says Jehovah, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to Jehovah, saying, I beseech thee, O Jehovah, remember now how I have walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. 
and what he spoke of himself was true. He had done good. Jehovah, through a sign and through the prophet Isaiah, added an extra 15 years to Hezekiah's life. What happened during that time? He had opportunity to show the envoys from Babylon the temple treasures, which guaranteed their return and future conquest of the southern kingdom. His son Manasseh, who reversed all the religious reforms of his father and freely adopted the pagan religious cults, was born. From Second Chronicles 33, 1-7, speaking of Manasseh, But he did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah, like the abominations of the heathens whom Jehovah had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Baalim and made groves, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of Jehovah, whereof Jehovah has said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of Jehovah. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with a familiar spirit, and wizard. He wrought much evil in the sight of Jehovah to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image of the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Some say that Manasseh is a candidate for the worst king of all, although it does appear that later in life he repented. On Hezekiah's behalf, he did not know that his son would do these wicked things, but it is interesting that his pride had caused him to create the vulnerability to Babylon by the exhibition of the temple riches in the same time period that his son was born. There were others who received second chances, including Samson and Jonah and Gomer. And then there was Peter, who had denied Yeshua three times in the courtyard outside the high priest's palace. In John chapter 21, we see Yeshua restore him by asking him three times, Do you love me? I imagine that Peter, although distressed, was very grateful. Peter did go on to fulfill the Lord's commission over his life as a faithful servant, teaching many the ways of Yehovah and Yeshua. There are also two second chance holidays. The first is Passover. When we look at the appointed times of Yehovah, we see they trace a very specific path for the walk of the believer. Passover is the beginning of that walk, an opportunity to come out of Egypt, the worldly life, and begin, by faith, to follow the Creator of the universe. Nothing else can happen in the believer's life until this commitment is made. Thus we see in Numbers 9, verses 6 through 8, And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering to Jehovah in this appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said to them, Stand still, and I will hear what Jehovah will command concerning you. The question was important enough that Moses went to inquire of the Lord, continuing in verses 9-12. through 12. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto Jehovah, the fourteenth day of the second month at even, then shall he eat it, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it unto morning, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. In fact, according to this ruling, did Hezekiah keep Passover in Second Chronicles chapter 30. Finally, although not a biblical injunction, we see that the Maccabees celebrated Sukkot, tabernacles, at the time of Hanukkah, because the temple was defiled in the seventh month. In 2 Maccabees, the celebration is compared to the festival of Sukkot, that is the festival of tabernacles or of booths, which they were unable to celebrate because of the invasion of Antiochus. From 2 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, We besought the Lord, and we were heard, and we offered sacrifice and cereal offering, and we lighted the lamps and set out the loaves. And now see that you keep the Feast of Booths in the month of Kislev, which is the ninth month, in the 188th year. From verse 18, 
Since on the 25th day of Kislev we shall celebrate the purification of the temple, we thought it necessary to notify you in order that you also may celebrate the Feast of Booths and the Feast of the Fire given when Nehemiah, who built the temple on the altar, offered sacrifices. Continuing in Second Maccabees chapter 10, verses 5-7. through 7. It happened that on the same day on which a sanctuary had been profaned by the foreigners, the purification of the sanctuary took place, that is, on the 25th day of the same month, which is Kislev, which is a traditional celebration of Hanukkah. In verse 6, And they celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing in the manner of the Feast of Booths, remembering how not long before, during the Feast of Booths, they had been wandering in the mountains and caves like wild animals, therefore bearing ivy-wreathed wands and beautiful branches and also fronds of palms, they offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of his own holy place. Here we see all the language of celebrating tabernacles. Just a note, whatever you have heard about finding enough consecrated oil to last only one day and it being a miracle that it lasted eight, This is a rabbinical construct. The rabbis were concerned that if there were not some miracle associated with Hanukkah, that the Maccabees would get too much credit, and they were looking for something to ensure that the people gave glory to Yehovah. Was it not enough that the tiny Maccabee army had defeated the whole tremendous army of Antiochus? Surely that was the strong arm of the Lord. And then they had the heart to make sure that the festival was celebrated as prescribed in Leviticus, even if it was out of time. Now, if you are a born-again believer in Messiah, then you have already received your second chance. What are you making of your time? And if you are not, and you are wondering about how you can start again, get a fresh start and a new start, then you should find that person in your life who can teach you about that golden opportunity. I know you know who that person is. Hello, is the Lord.